Hello, 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 everyone. This is Zachary Johnson. I'm the uh, drinks editor for Uprox Life. And this is Beverage's panel discussion about the woman behind Tennessee whiskey. I'm so excited for today's uh, discussion because uh, we're going to dive into what Tennessee whiskey is, but also talk about the women in the industry who are pushing it forward. Um, so, you know, these panel discussions are just basically designed to be educational forums. So if you do have questions, throw them into the side and we'll do a Q&A at the end. Um, and before we dive in, I just want to tell you a little bit about Beverage. I mean, this is a place where, like I said, we're going to have these educational panels, but also you can buy a tasting kit. There's going to be content about uh, spirits, trends, tastings, investing, business, everything about whiskey you can find right here. Um, so diving in today, we have two very special guests that I'm really excited to talk about. And for the first time, we have someone that isn't a distiller or a blender or making barrels. We have someone who's actually selling whiskey, who's behind the business. And that's uh, Kate Jerkins, who's the chief business officer for Uncle Mears, which frankly is one of the biggest brands of the last five years by far. Um, that's become so successful through Fawn Weaver and Victoria D. Butler as the blender and uh, owner, respectively. Um, you know, Kate comes from a business background and she's basically responsible for sales, marketing and distribution of Uncle Miris throughout the entire world. Kate, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. Yeah. And uh, can you just give us a, a quick, you know, rundown of how you got into Uncle Miris? Absolutely. So uh, Fawn, our CEO, and I worked together years and years ago in the hotel business. So that's uh, my background, okay. about 15 plus years in the hospitality industry. And I worked with her on another project around 2015. And late 2016, by the way, she'd sort of like, she'd been kind of, we worked on a project, but I wasn't hearing from her as much for a few months. And now I come to understand that, you know, in the middle of 2016, she had discovered the story of Jack and Uncle Nearest, excuse me, story of Nearest and Jack. And she came to me in December 2016 and said, Kate, we discovered this story and we're going to launch a whiskey company. And I'd like you to do that with us. It was her husband, Keith, on the phone as well, alongside Fawn. And my first response, sorry, whiskey lovers, was I drink Chardonnay. <laughs> what do I know about whiskey? And so I spent the next few months like hardcore, you know, reading everything. Um, it's not a bad job when you have to learn how to drink whiskey. It was, you know, pretty good research time. Um, and then from that moment forward, I started working on this project. We So I started December 2016. Uh, we launched July 2017. And I was tasked with building a team and building a distribution network in which we were able to get our product into all 50 states and D.C. within two years of our launch. Um, right. And now working on some of our global expansion as well. So really fun. Awesome. But I, I fell right into it. Put that Chardonnay glass down and picked up a Glencairn. <laughs> yeah, and it it can't be understated. The uh, the success of the brand has been astronomical. So uh, congratulations on Thank that. You. Uh, yeah. But before we dive in more, I want to bring on our second guest, who is um, Alex Castle. She's the master distiller for Old Dominic Distillery. Alex's uh, reputation goes all the way back to Wild Turkey. Uh, she went to the University of Kentucky, where she got a chemical engineering degree, um, and then moved to Tennessee where, uh, you know, she became a master distiller of Old Dominic, which is putting out uh, a new line of uh, whiskeys right now. But also, Alex is the first female president of the Tennessee Distillers Guild. So if anything, she's probably one of the best people to talk about women in Tennessee whiskey, but also just Tennessee whiskey in general. So Alex, welcome to the panel. Thank you for joining us. Can you give us a, a little bit more detailed rundown of uh, how you became a master distiller? Yeah, first, I'm drinking wine. So, Kate, you're not All right. right. <laughs> you spend all day tasting whiskey. You, so you yeah, need a break at the end of the day. <laughs> that's so oh, God, fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I love that. Um, so, yeah, I came to Old Dominic uh, about six and a half years ago now. Um, I was a production supervisor at Wild Turkey. I had been there for four years, uh, responsible for first and third shift and oversaw all whiskey production from grain receiving through mashing, fermentation, distillation, as well as our byproducts. Um, and one day ended up getting a message on LinkedIn of all places. I think I was one of the few users who actually kept my profile up to date at the time. And uh, 
it asked me, I was a, um, a consultant, asked if I knew of anyone that was interested in moving to Memphis to start a distillery. And I took about two days to think about it, talk to my husband about it and decided to go for it, try it. Didn't know if the opportunity would ever come up again. Um, wow. So my first, first time to Memphis ever was for my interview. <laughs> and we moved I, like three months later, I think. Um, so I've been here since 2015. Uh, the building that we're in now, uh, the, the company owned it, but it was completely vacant. Uh, the staircases that existed then do not exist today. And the ones that exist today definitely did not exist back then. <laughs> um, it, so it's, it was a phenomenal experience getting to see it go from really just a concept to, to reality. And this year is a huge year for us because we are actually releasing our first Tennessee whiskey. Nice. Yeah, that's why I'm really excited to talk about this. I'm an old school Tennessee whiskey fan. I mean, that's what I grew up on. Well, grew up on, yeah, just quote unquote, you know what I mean. Um, and so seeing like Tennessee whiskey starting to get the respect it deserves and in large part, you know, with, you know, new distilleries like Old Dominic, you know, coming to the foray, but also Uncle Miris bringing the history back to the forefront. Um, I'm really excited for this discussion, but I do want to start with what Tennessee whiskey is fundamentally, and I think Alex, since you are a master distiller in Tennessee, you could answer that best for us. I don't know. You're asking a Kentucky girl to talk about Tennessee whiskey, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just Perfect. putting that out there now. Um, so Tennessee whiskey checks every single box that bourbon checks. It's an American-made spirit. It's at least 51% corn. It's aged in new charred oak barrels. Um, also has the various concepts of straight whiskey and bottle and bond has to check all those boxes, but Tennessee wanted a way to differentiate itself from its Northern neighbor. Kentucky was making a name for itself with bourbon and Tennessee wanted something that said, this is Tennessee. And so that's when they, they came up with the, uh, Lincoln County process and decided to kind of own that as its definition. But even that definition wasn't formally adopted, that charcoal mellowing wasn't formally adopted until not that long ago. It was, um, right. I think it was the 2000s when it was formally adopted. Okay. Um, so because what people also don't realize, unlike our northern neighbors, the distilling industry in Tennessee, with the exception of three distilleries, is actually relatively new. We right. were not allowed to distill outside of three counties until 2009, 2010. So that's why Tennessee whiskey really hasn't been a huge section of the whiskey aisle until recently it's because we just didn't have, we didn't have the producers. Right. And that's what's interesting to me is uh, the growth has been massive in the last five years. And, you know, Kate, you know, part of that is, you know, Uncle Mira's coming on the scene as well. And you guys opened your own distillery during the uh, pandemic years. So the growth is happening. Um, I just want to go a little bit deeper into Tennessee whiskey because I think, uh, you know, everyone talks about the Lincoln County process because that is a huge differentiation. But the mash bills do tend to be a bit different. You know, uh, if you, you know, go in Tennessee whiskey tends to be 80% corn or more where Kentucky bourbon tends to hang out in that 70 to 74% mm -hmm. corn ratio. Um, as a distiller who's actually in there in the trenches and uh, the fermenters and things like that, can you talk a little bit about that differentiation with that a little bit more corn in there, what's actually happening with the taste or flavor profile? Well, it's funny you bring up that they tend to be 80 because ours is 75% corn. So <laughs> well, you're from I, so. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of went the more traditional bourbon mash bill route, okay. um, really to differentiate us to, you know, I, everyone knows what Tennessee whiskey is supposed to taste like, and it's one or two brands and it was trying to be different. Um, but getting that extra corn adds that much more sweetness to it. Usually you add rye to try and give it some spikes. You add wheat to give it softness. Um, and so the corn is going to give it that, that sweeter characteristic that really has kind of become identifiable as Tennessee whiskey. Um, but I'll be honest, all the Tennessee whiskeys that have come out, I could not tell you every single mash bill. So I don't, I don't know if there are some others that are, are, are going, going rogue. <laughs> <laughs> We're all, all, sure. all of our mash bills are in the eight, corn is in the eighties and above. So. Right. But we have yeah, it's a, 
Yeah, well, that's what's fascinating, right? As the uh, regional style expands, people are going to experiment and do, you know, uh, tons of different things. Um, so let's sort of talk a little bit more about um, Tennessee whiskey, because I feel like even though it's still pretty small, it's very female driven. Um, of course, you have Nicole Austin and George Dickel, you know, um, Uncle Nearest is built entirely around a female team. Um, Alex, you're at Old Dominic. Um, you know, Lexi out at Jack Daniels is, you know, primed to become the next master distiller. You know, there are a lot of women leading Tennessee whiskey right now. And because it is burgeoning uh, style, it feels like a good place to talk about women in whiskey in general. Um, Kate, can you sort of talk us through Uncle Nearest's ethos and why, um, you know, you have such a core female driven uh, company. Sure. I wanted to say one quick thing on the on the Tennessee whiskey and the Lincoln County process, because, you know, <laughs> Tennessee whiskey used to get it gets it has a certain people think of it in a certain way. But one of the key things we talk about, we actually refer to uh, Tennessee whiskey as bourbon plus because the extra process of filtering it through like going through the sugar maple charcoal and going through all that and the amount of time it takes to grow the trees chop them down turn them into charcoal and go it's a lot of extra time yeah. and energy and and um but our you know our cogs are very their cost of goods is very different than anyone that doesn't have to do that final finishing process so I think the education for Tennessee whiskey has grown a lot in the last five years and people understanding that this this process actually premiumizes it. And that's why we were very um, we, we set forth with a product that was SRP at $60 to start our first product because we wanted people to understand this is a premium spirit. There's extra love and attention being put into it. Um, yeah, so it. You know, it's just something I think it's interesting people to learn because you it's not just one brand and it's not just one thing. I mean, it is, it is a lot of hard work behind it. Um, for us, I will say being an all-female team sort of happened naturally, but I'd be remiss to not talk about one of the key players on our team is Sherry Moore. Um, and Sherry Moore worked for Jack Daniels for 31 years. She was their head of whiskey operations, and she was really probably one of the first women in Tennessee whiskey to really break barriers um, and did so much incredible work at Jack Daniels. And she was actually someone who had approached Fawn and had said, you know, once Fawn had discovered the story, if you ever want to do a whiskey, I'd even come out of retirement for you. So when Nira's family came to Fawn in 2016 and said, we want to do a whiskey, Fawn left that meeting and she's like, did you mean it? <laughs> because, you know, and so it was, it just so happened that, you know, Fawn and I had a working relationship. Sherry had stepped up. And then Victoria, when we ended up bringing her on the team, she had retired from an entirely different career, came on to be an, on the admin side for us and helped us with our first small batch blending. And we realized that was where her talents were. And it's, it, she just kept winning awards and doing so well. And so she just, eat, you know, and, and what's not to love, she's probably one of the most lovable. She's the best huggers, has the best laugh. And she's really damn good at making, at blending whiskey. So um, it just kind of came all naturally. But I think what I'm seeing is that's inspirational for people. For me, it's a breath of fresh air because when I'm not with my team, I'm out in the world. There's not a lot of other, there's not, it feels like a little, it's like its own little safety net because otherwise there's, it's, it's not what I was seeing when I was working on launching this brand. I was walking into rooms with men all the time, all the time. And there, you know, not a lot of, not a lot of diversity outside, not just gender, but we're, you know, or but we're looking at, you know, just race and everything, which is a big topic we're obviously all talking about right now. But um, it's been an amazing ride. I and mean, we ended up hiring a VP of marketing who just happens to be awesome and female, you know, but we're also very cognizant that our team be reflective of America. So I would say we're about 50, 50 men and, and women on our team. And we really think about that. And we're really um, trying to ensure that we really represent America when we're out in the world. Nice. Yeah. And today, you know, it comes through and I think, the way the brand is presented as well as being uh, a place where, you know, you, you're thinking about all this. And I, I feel like for the consumer, they see that and there's more confidence in buying that bottle on the shelf with, uh, with that background being so pre uh, prevalent. Um, Absolutely. Al and, you know, Alex, you know, coming from Kentucky, I mean, you know, you specifically you work for the Russells, but also, you know, the nose, 
uh, Harlan, you know, there, there's a lot of big male names in that industry, even today still. Um, but there are a lot of people also working, you know, there's Elizabeth McCall, you know, mm -hmm. there, you know, it is changing. There's a sea change coming. Um, you know, as a female distiller, um, what have you seen change the most just in your uh, professional experience over the last few years? I mean, first, I, I've seen more women actually in production that when I started, I actually started at what became Town Branch Bourbon um, all the way back in 2008. Um, you, you just didn't have women in the industry. And if they, or if you did, you didn't see them, you didn't hear about them. Yeah. Um, so to me, that meant they weren't there <laughs> because I couldn't see them there. Um, and so, and even starting at Wild Turkey, I, I was the only woman in a, a supervisor or management role as far as production was concerned. Yes, we had our accounting team that had women in it. We had some people in the lab doing quality control that were female and that was great, but that, that was kind of where they were confined. Um, but even in the four years I was there, I started to see more women come into manufacturing. You know, we added a packaging facility while I was there. We finally had some women supervisors in that facility um, and have definitely seen that increase even, even since leaving Wild Turkey. Um, so that probably has been the biggest change um, all around, but just the fact that we're now talking about it. We are recognizing that it's not just the good old boys club. They're not the only ones we need to be talking about and acknowledging and lifting up. Um, and what's great is it's not just women lifting up other women in the industry. I'm starting to see the men in this industry and even, even the supporters of the industry. So the podcasts and the bloggers sure. and the, the writers, they also, the men in those roles are also stepping up and lifting up women and other minorities in this industry in a way that just was basically unheard of 10 years ago and, and definitely 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, it's a, it's a much more welcoming industry now. Right. And do you sort of, and maybe uh, Kate, you can talk to this as well, but do you sort of see the sea change and the shift uh, behind the scenes as well? Because, you know, there, there are more issues than just, you know, outward facing, hey, we have a female master distiller or a female master blender. I mean, there's practicalities behind the scenes too when it comes to fair wages, you know, uh, maternity leave without losing your job, you know, and things like that. So how has like the behind the scenes shifted over the last few years? For me, I would say it probably depends on, on the company. So yeah. it, is it a family owned company versus a large corporation? Large corporations have a tendency to have a lot more incentive to embrace that change and, and shift with what society is, is showing it needs to do. Um, so I, I think it, yes, I'm seeing it, but I think it's really situational. It depends on which company you're you're talking about. Yeah, I would agree. I, I sit on a DE&I council with the Distilled, Distilled Spirits Council of the United States. And so that's a um, we have a biweekly meeting and that is what I'm sort of the craft representative on that. Otherwise it's all the big guys and a lot, and they're very engaged. And I will say there is a big, there's a lot of change brewing. Um, there's a lot of metrics when it comes to human resources and managers right now that they're having to measure what they're doing for diversity and looking at all of those things. And even just bringing up, for instance, Zach maternity leave, you know, those are things that people don't put in that category, but it's so important, right? Like, and, and, but that's more of like, a, I could go on and on about how our country treats women who are mothers. Um, but you know, all those things, it's, are, yeah, it's, it's wild, but everyone's, everyone's talking about it. People are anxious for everything to move faster, but we have to also understand that it does. There's a, it takes a long time to make change, but we're seeing subtle, subtle changes. And then companies like mine, you know, that ours that is, still younger like we haven't had to look at all this like for instance i have my first teammate team member that's pregnant so i'm like okay so we'll let she's gonna be our case study what do we want to do to do things different you know things like that and i think that's how we have to kind of we're gonna have to look at it moving forward absolutely i think uh you know i 
full disclosure, I live in Europe, so and I also live in Germany, which is sort of like the gold standard of. They love their moms know, there. <laughs> yeah, they really do. I mean, and their dads. I mean, you know. You're right. Good point. you leave happens it's as both. well. Um, yeah, you know, and so and there's a you know a system in place, it's, so it's not comparable. Like it's, it's apples and oranges because there's already a system here in place, whereas that tends to fall on the shoulders of the company or family in the U.S., which is you know. It, you know, almost worth not comparing at all because it's just so different. Um, but there's more to it than that. I, you know, you see companies like Diageo that has a policy of 50-50, like for, you know, for their leadership, for their distillers and their 50% women, 50% men, you know, to keep things equal. Um, what's your sort of view on that? Do you think a policy like that works or do you feel like, well, once they get to that 50% point, they can tap out and say, we did a good job? I think it's necessary right now. I think that one could be debated a lot. I don't, I don't, you know, I do have this, I, I think about a lot, like is our country is really hyped right now to, to really work on diversity and inclusion. My, I have this little thing in the back of my head that keeps saying, but when are, are we going to stop doing that? Or is this what we do now? Right? Because I think it's, there's a lot of stuff in the forefront. So I know for me, as long as I'm working, I will continue to push that through in any company I work for and in any industry I'm in. I think it is necessary. I think some of these big guys, have, they're very numbers driven and stats driven. So if you don't give a specific number, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get what you need. But what we're discovering in a couple of places right now is that as much as we may want to hire more women or more people of color, the um like the bench strength isn't there because you know there's maybe not a lot of women honestly alex that even know about distill distilling or even think about working for whisk in, in, in with the whiskey industry or the spirits industry you know and some people fall into this business so there's work that has to be done on recruitment and you know education so people know that this is a legit hello like look at the numbers <laughs> this is a very <laughs> legit industry in the united states and if you're paying attention during the pandemic one that was thriving. So I think, you know, maybe some of that and the attention to that will con continue to bring more women and people of color into this industry. But we definitely have a challenge with bench. It's not all just about, you can't just put a woman or an African-American man or whatever it is into a position if we aren't, if we aren't finding bench strength or bringing people or, or helping to train and bring people up along with you. Right. That's a very, very valid, uh, good point. Um, and so, Alex, looking at like the Tennessee Distillers Guild, um, which you are the president of, congratulations on that, by the way. Um, you know, and then also, you know, um, with the initiative that Uncle Nearest is spearheading with Jack to do that, can you sort of walk us through like what are the opportunities um, women have now, either through the Distillers Guild or through the, uh, the Jack Nearest initiative? to actually rise in this industry and to you know get on that bench so to speak yeah i mean one the the guild just offers over 30 distilleries so i mean that's that's a large network to get your foot in the door and a lot of them are small so they're they're not necessarily looking for someone with 10 years of industry experience because they can't necessarily afford that price tag right. um and so they can afford a little more hands-on training to help build that bench. That's, that's a great starting point are the small distilleries. Uh, but we also, we work with the, the uncle nearest initiative. We also do, um, we're trying to work with the step up foundation that ACSA and discus has started very similar, um, goal as the uncle nearest and Jack, um, project to try and help distilleries find the resources, make the connections so that they can hopefully expand their hiring and whether it's through internships or just other training programs, help give them the resources. Cause just from, from my experience alone, trying to find um, candidates that fit everything we could possibly want. It's hard. Um, like in West Tennessee, we're the only, only distillery on the Tennessee whiskey trail. So if I want experience, I got nothing. <laughs> I have nothing. My, ben my bench is non-existent <laughs> in West Tennessee. Right. So trying to achieve those diversity goals is that much more difficult because I, there's, the pool is, is non-existent. Um, so the Guild and all of these different initiatives are aimed at helping 
distilleries like Old Dominic and ones even smaller than us that are in rural parts of the state to, to help guide them and give them the resources to achieve their whatever their business goals are associated with their desire for for diversity. Um, and so hopefully, hopefully we'll start to see a shift in Tennessee because um, I, I would I would argue we're not we're not the most diverse <laughs> industry in Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> The Kate, how, can you kind of walk us through agree, the yeah. uh, nearest Jack initiative and what they're doing with uh, the sort of acceleration program there? Yeah, so we partnered with Jack Daniels in June of 2020 um, when our country was undergoing <clears throat> or beginning the unrest that I can't say is gone or has continued. Um, and we 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 basically committed each five million dollars to the nearest and Jack Advancement Initiative, and it's a three prong initiative. Number one being our business incubator program. And our first business in that was Denord Spirits, which was based out of Minneapolis. And Chris Montana, who is who owns Denord, who's the master distiller there, had lost basically everything um, and, and all the unrest that had happened in Minneapolis. So he was this very obvious first choice. And um, they kind of just graduated. There's been a lot of press releases and stuff. It's been amazing. But between the Jack team and our team, we helped them with branding operations, um, distribution networks, marketing, a little bit of everything, got them back on their feet. But like much more than that, we were able to help with rebrand. Like it's such a it's such a great product. All their products are great. The rebrand is beautiful and they're doing so well. So that was, that's one prong. So we're looking for our next business to incubate. And then we have our two members of the Leadership uh, Apprentice Program. So right now on our side, we have Tracy Franklin, who if you don't know her name, you will someday. Um, and she was a global ambassador for Scotch for Glenn Fittich and now is oh, wow. on this distiller. She's basically on this big distiller apprentice training. She's worked with you, Alex, I believe, right? And she's amazing. She's worked all over the country with different different distilleries. And you know, our goal obviously would be to put Tracy in a position where she could be someone's next master distiller. It's an African American female. You're not seeing that in this industry at all. Um, no requirement that it's with us either, but we want to get her to a place where she's she's ready for that. And then the third piece is a program at Motlow State College, which is a, a distillation program. So you would actually get a degree in distillation. Because the reality is, is that there's not really a lot of places to go to school for distillation or to even understand it. So imagine you're in school and you're looking at all the things you can major in. You know, that seems kind of cool. And I could imagine some young guys, young guys and gals and whoever looking at me like, man, I'm going to learn how to make whiskey in college. Yeah, this is rad. And that might help us get some more um, people on the right track. We're really, we're really more aimed at BIPOC, but the byproduct of that is that we have, have ended up helping women as well. Um, and, and through starting that initiative, Fawn and I have had have about 18 other companies that are BIPOC or female owned, small companies kind of starting out that have reached into us and have kind of become our phone of friends. So we've been working with a lot of different companies in the last couple of years to really support them. Nice. Yeah, and that's, you know, I feel like this is, where it starts and how it succeeds is, is people actually taking the initiative and uh, supporting this. Like for me, for instance, you know, I think back, you know, when I was looking at going to college, like being a distiller or a brewer was, it yeah. never even occurred to me that you could go to And what would your that. parents say? I actually have to think that my parents would be like, you're yeah. Yeah. My, parents, my, parents, history. <laughs> my parents were the ones that told me to do it. Oh, that's oh, nice. cool. Yeah, you're in Kentucky, that so cool. that's sort of, that's a, you know. Um, you had a little whiskey I, in your sippy cup, though, right? It's like, be honest. Yeah. My parents didn't drink. Oh, wow. Oh, I'm um, fascinated. I feel like this could, we could go on a whole nother. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to talk about that now. Um, yeah. No, but be, before we get back into uh, the beauty of Tennessee whiskey, um, I just want to, you know, I don't mean to be maudlin or, you know, take down the vibe or anything, but. I feel like it's also important to talk about what you haven't seen change that you think should be changing because, you know, we can talk about all the good and the good and the good, but, you know, we can't ignore the bad either. So uh, maybe from a distiller point of view, I mean, you know, uh, you have a lot of access to what's going on in your industry through the guild. You know, what do you think isn't changing that you're sort of giving the side eye to or putting on the list to change? Um, I, so one, I, I, I definitely do see it still as a boys club. You know, there's still 
golf outings and things like that, where women within the distilleries are being excluded from those and business conversations happen. So that kind of crap is still happening. Everything you saw in Mad Men, that there is some of that is still going on. Um, and it's infuriating. Um, but that, I mean, that's so deeply ingrained that that's a, that's a change that's going to take a long, long time, I think, to really, really get rid of it. Um, and it's going to be dependent on your company. Um, but one other thing that I can't wait for this to change, and I think it's only going to be through education, but going to tastings, interacting with consumers. I don't know how many times I've gotten into arguments with men about uh, bourbon being made outside of Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I, I get yeah. bourbon. I get bourbon splained, as I like to say it, on a regular basis, and it's just. And and I want to look at it and be like, if I was a man, you wouldn't be saying this to me. I know you wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, that's a uh, hundred percent right. <laughs> but there's nothing more badass than a woman that can just like knock out all the bourbon facts. And <laughs> I love it. Like I think it's so fun too because it's so un it's still so unexpected. You know, well, and then when when you look at the guy and you're like, I was born and raised in Kentucky. Yeah. You really you really want to argue with me about Kentucky yeah. bourbon. Do you know what I do for a job all day long? <laughs> and can we also just talk about I don't like golf. I tried it, but why can't there be other activities where we do things like, uh, you know, even bowling would be better for me if we could just <laughs> change. Like golf, it's like I don't care even if man or woman. It's not. It's just, I'm not good at it, and I'm frustrated. I don't understand why that's the go-to still. I, I hate it. Change that, <laughs> Alex. We're gonna change it. <laughs> yeah. I uh, I don't golf either. It's a, but I I look at the map around Kentucky, and it's just like, oh look, there's more golf courses than anything else. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a yeah, it's a wild thing. I I uh, I wholeheartedly agree. You know, the boys' club. I mean. I'm also coming from an indigenous background and there are some interesting distillers working in Washington state on reservations now getting into distilling and trying to overcome the old racist ideas of, you know, indigenous people and alcohol. And so, you know, there's a long way to go, but I think more people talk about these issues, the more, you know, these issues can be overcome. Um, even if it's something as simple as not doing business on a golf course because it's boring. New rule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, new rule. Anywhere but the golf course. <laughs> Think how creative uh, we could be, though, if we could find some alternative. We can make a big list. We're going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. luckily there's horse racing. This could maybe a horse track. I don't know. <laughs> sure. Everyone's I would prefer that's a very that. level playing field. It's not a skill based activity unless you're really good at betting the horses, <laughs> but you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I know we usually keep the Q and A till the end, but I had, I really like this question. I think it sort of feels more appropriate right now. But um, Jennifer H asks, um, you know, with distilleries in almost every state and a lot of women involved in those, are there networking opportunities for women in the industry nationwide? Oh, oh my gosh, so many. Yeah, between so Bourbon Women, which started in in Kentucky by Peggy No Stevens, who is. Like, if you don't know her, look her up, follow her on Instagram, but she is like the preeminent, like, I think if you think about women in, in bourbon in Kentucky, you would think about Peggy No Stevens. And that's a great organization that does an annual event that brings women from all, they do an event in, in August that brings all these women to Kentucky. And it is a wild group. Like, it's so fun and it's young and old and like, it's just the most amazing eclectic and group it, of it's, women. It's industry people, because I attend yeah. it. Like, yeah. I don't even speak of it. I just attend it and have a yeah. ball. So it's industry people, but it's also anyone and everyone. It is such it a is so fun. Yeah. And then they have organizations all over the U.S. And then we have an organization called Women of the Vine and Spirits. And that one was, you know, that one's a little bit in, in my, you know, it's more inclusive because it's the entire, our entire industry. So, um, you know, lot, there's a lot, you will see a lot more women involved in wine and wineries, I would say, from, from what I've seen. And I grew up in Sonoma County area and saw that just because it's a very family based business. So if you have a bunch of daughters, you know, I grew up with or went to school with girls that aren't women now that are, you know, work for wineries. Um, but it's a nice, it's a really great organization and they do a lot of work with um, giving out scholarships for, for advancement and training and that kind of stuff. And you see, you've, there, you've seen a lot of amazing women coming through their programs that they've done. So I'm, there's more, I mean, and anywhere you live, right. You can find a women's organization that for women who love whiskey. 
Well, and if you're in the industry, organizations like the American Craft Spirits Association yeah. and the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States, they are nationwide. They are men, women, it, everyone is a part of them. And it, it is such a great networking opportunity. I, I, they might start finally having some women focus things within those organizations. But right. as you make connections at their conferences, you kind of form your own little little groups and you can make those connections that way. Absolutely. Right on. Right on. I think it's like, I don't know if this is, if I'm allowed to say this, I'm going to just go <coughs> for it too. I think um, attending some of the like spirits driven conferences, my first couple of years, this is going to be a little controversial, but I think one of the issues with women in the industry is that um, traditionally a lot of spirits brands and beer brands have used women to sell. So it's yeah. like, it's a man's beverage and women are selling it like this and I think that is the mindset focus. It's like when I'm, I, you know, I'm in the spirits business, but I'm not, I'm not doing this, I'm doing this or whatever it might be. And that's no disrespect to anyone who's ever been what they call like a shop girl or been out there at these events. But there is this big mindset change that has to, because the spirits industry has always been a man's world with women there kind of serving versus participating. And it really was honestly, I will be year one. It was a real turn off for me. And I'm from the hospitality industry that also is very much like boys club and all that kind of stuff, but not, wasn't as pervasive and as obvious as I think it is in the spirits industry. Yeah. I, I was at Wild Turkey when American Honey was having its heyday. And if you remember the, the honey girls, the American honey girls <laughs> and their Daisy yeah. Dukes and tank tops, it was really hard to attend yeah. events with them there. That'd be, be like, very yeah, hard for me. I'm in production. Yeah, they're like, why are you wearing that? <laughs> that's a yeah. That's it's and it's wild to me how not long ago that was. I mean, we're talking. And it's still happening. You know, yeah, there's a lot absolutely. of you. A lot of us have to rely on using tape companies to do tastings at certain stores and stuff. And when you go, it's like it's not a lot of men that are doing that. It's women, right? So it's it's it's, it's, it's there's flip. There's parts of this industry that are very female you know, and then the, so the perception sort of, of women in the industry changes because they're seen only in one particular light. Right. right. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> fascinating to me because it's, uh, it, it, I do look back and it's like, what the hell were people thinking back then? You know, it's, there it is. And especially now today, because you can go back and you watch this stuff on YouTube or on, you know, Instagram yeah. or whatever, and you just, it's kind of mind blowing. And I, also worked in beer for a while um and it's the same there it's just like yeah mind-blowing how uh regressive it was just a few years ago you know and uh thankfully i think people are finally waking up to that and changing across the spirits industry yeah. from the bars to commercials to the boardroom um let's talk a little bit about tennessee whiskey because i feel like uh you know that's a that's a, a big part of why you're both here and i was really excited to have you on Cape to talk about the actual business behind it as well, because I feel like, um, you know, we love talking, of course, the distillers and blenders here, as I mentioned in the beginning, and that's one hugely important aspect. But, you know, talking to someone who actually has to sell this stuff, you know, you know, in Tennessee, you have to sell the stuff in Kentucky. You know, when you get out of the airport in Louisville at Muhammad Ali, you know, there's this huge sign there that says, you know, the number one whiskey in Kentucky is from Tennessee, Uncle Nearest. Um, controversial we like it though <laughs> yeah i mean it gets your attention um so can you can you just uh talk to us a little bit about actually selling tennessee whiskey to the world yes absolutely i think since day one it's 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 always an uphill battle and it's a it's a manner of differentiation but also compartmentalizing so that people understand back to what alex was saying at the very beginning we are we are if, if, if kentucky bourbon or or bourbon does not have to be from kentucky if you are a bourbon fan tennessee whiskey is a bourbon with an extra step that's it that's it so you you know there's this perception that it's so different but it's really not yes sure the mash bill is a little different it's a little sweeter well it's sweeter because of the corn but it's also a little sweeter because it filters through sugar maple charcoal so you get those hints of sweetness um because there's not been a ton of tennessee whiskey on the market prior to i'd say the last five years it's also just the category itself has been so small people just didn't really look at it or understand, you know, really understand it. Um, if you'll notice on our bottles, you know, we pay homage to Tennessee all over it, but it doesn't say Tennessee whiskey on it. It says premium whiskey. 
was strategic for us so that people understood where we were from, but that we weren't categorizing ourselves or labeling, labeling ourselves. I'm seeing more in total wines in various places that were kind of more in an American whiskey category versus just Tennessee, which is so small. Um, for us, we have an advantage because of our story and the link to our story and the link to us being, you know, you know, what we refer to near screen is the godfather of Tennessee whiskey. What we know is that he was using what's now called the Lincoln County process to filter his whiskey. That process can be linked all the way back to West Africa. So we're, we've never claimed that he brought that here or that it's, but we know that Nearest who was making whiskey and who was mentoring a young Jack was using that filtration process. So being able to tell that story has been extremely helpful to us. Um, I don't know if that, is that helpful at all? You know, I can, if you have any more, I don't know if I've answered it all, but I think really it's yeah. education. And it's, we, we literally, Alex, we, we use the ABCs of bourbon and then we went to the ABCs of Tennessee whiskey, boom, 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 plus, this filtration process. And for, for you, Alex, I mean, you're, you're making this stuff, but also again, you're president of the distillers guild. And uh, do you feel like it is still an uphill battle to, to get that education across or do you, is it getting easier? I, I do think there is still a slight uphill um, just because most of the distilleries in Tennessee are honestly just now getting their Tennessee whiskey out. Um, the ones who've had whiskey out prior to now have been doing malt whiskeys like Chattanooga whiskey um, or sourcing. And so most of us are just now really getting our, our true Tennessee whiskeys out there. And so in the consumer's perception, they've either tried Jack Daniels or they've tried George Dickel. They either liked them or they disliked them. And if they disliked them, it's really uphill battle because we've got to convince them that we don't all taste the same, just like, not every bourbon out of Kentucky tastes the same, um, but there seems to be like, and people, people seem to understand that about Kentucky bourbon. They seem to understand that they're all different. You have the rise, you have the wheats, you have all of these things. And yet for some reason with Tennessee was he, there seems to be this assumption that we all taste like Jack or we all taste like George. And someone had a bad experience with one of them in college. And now we're all just, <laughs> we're all in trouble as a result of it. Yeah. Uh, and so $2 Jack and Coke night does not equal even, it's not even fair to represent Jack like that. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> Try it as an adult. <laughs> so I, tr I truly believe we are still fighting that battle to, to show people that we are not all the same. We are just as unique and different as all of the different bourbons that come out of Kentucky and that you can like your Kentucky bourbons and you can also still like your Tennessee whiskeys. So I do think there is still that education factor but I think having so many Tennessee whiskeys coming to market starting just a couple of years ago and on into the next year or so, I think that will do a lot of good in, in helping the consumer get over that gap. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, I was looking at how I, like when I was starting to drink, you know, back in the day in college days, and even when I was a kid, you know, seeing my grandparents drink or my, you know, my family or whatever, the adults in my family. And, you know, Tennessee whiskey was always the good stuff. And Kentucky bourbon was always rough cut. Like you kept Tennessee whiskey on your bar in your, in your home and you kept Kentucky bourbon in the garage under the sink sort of thing, you know, like that was the <laughs> differentiation. Um, so like, just going back to that. So I always talk, it's like, whenever I talk about Tennessee whiskey, it's like, no, this is the good stuff because you know that, that extra step does truly make a, it makes a difference. I mean, it is more refined, you know, it's, uh, you know, there's a reason there's single malt and blended scotch, you know, they're, they're two different things because of the process, you know, and comparing them or treating them the same uh, never made sense to me. Um, but yeah, you know, it's uh, definitely the good stuff for, for where I'm from, you know, even if it was Jack Daniels, it was always, uh, you know, something that was a step up from, you know, Beam or Turkey or, you know, any of those uh, brands. So maybe we can turn that corner and come back around to that one day. That'd be good. <laughs> but uh, I want to, um, we got another question here that I wanted to go back to um, from uh, Leah Kingsley. Uh, what support do you feel you, the industry needs in order to help change uh, the perception that women participating rather than serving? I think more of this, right? Um, I mean, I hate to sound like this, but you know, our, our executive team was on the cover of American Whiskey Magazine, which 
you know, my five-year-old and I got to roll through Whole Foods one day and see women on the cover of American Whiskey magazine. I think more press, more more awareness, and more conversations like this. Truly, you know, and and you know, I I, I don't I, I really don't want to make anyone feel bad about the jobs they've done or what they've chosen, but I think that there, you know, that that there's some perceptions that we have to change, and I think the industry is changing it, and that. You know, I think we see it in every single industry, but right now I really do think it's the more press, the more visibility. I mean, knowing what Alex does, knowing who Sherry Moore is, knowing who, you know, my coworkers are, knowing knowing some of the amazing women also in Kentucky and just continuing this visibility and these conversations, I think are huge. And also just, I don't know, women women make up 30% of, of brown spirits drinkers in the United States. So that's a pretty low, you know, that's, you know, the, the, the low hanging fruit is to go after men and to advertise for men. So it's, you know, so us women in the industry right now are carrying on our back that we have got to con- continue to convert our friends drinking vodka sodas. <laughs> drinking whiskey. I mean, that is the bottom line. <laughs> and it is. No one, no one advertises to women. Not really. Or at least not, not in all sincerity. They might do no. a, they might do a post. Like yesterday, a lot of people yeah. did that were here. International women was said, it. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but it's like, who is it? Mila Kunis, who they used, she, you know, like she, that was the first like pretty bold, you know, brown spirit brand to come out with a woman, you know, which. Yeah. But you could I, argue she, that was geared towards. Towards men. Men. Yeah. And a little patronizing towards women because like, but does she drink whiskey? <laughs> does she, you know, great. By the way, no, no offense to her, but yes, to your point, it's like. And none of us walk through warehouses dressed like that. You don't. I'm so, <laughs> so confused. I mean, heels don't work on a gravel floor. Yeah, yeah apparently not. Yeah. 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 yeah um, if you work at a distillery, you know, even when I, I live in Los Angeles, when I visit Tennessee, I bring my least favorite shoes. Like, you got to, you go there, you're ready. You got to be ready to get dirty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it's, it's fascinating because, uh, yeah, again, that wasn't that long ago. I mean, we're talking a couple of years. Talks. Um, so, I think we uh, hit a good point here, and sort of want to wrap up. But before we we wrap up, um, Alex, uh, let's talk a little bit about what you're doing with Old Dominic and the new line that's coming out. Can you sort of walk us through uh, your your new line of whiskey? Yeah. Um, so we started producing whiskey um, in Memphis in t- December of 2016. First whiskey to be distilled in Memphis since at least prohibition. Um, And we do make three different mash bills. We do a Tennessee whiskey, which is that 75% corn, 13% rye, 12% malted barley uh, mash bill. We also have a high rye bourbon that's 52% corn, 44% rye. And we also have a wheat whiskey that's 83% wheat. Um, The Tennessee whiskey is is what we're hoping to be our flagship. And that's what comes out later this year. Um, It will be Tennessee only release, um, but we've, we finally started teasing it. Hopefully it'll start hitting, hitting markets around late Q3, early Q4. Supply chain makes me hesitant to commit to any dates at this point, Mm -hmm. Um, but it should be a really fun release. And then you'll start to see those um, Tennessee whiskey hit outside of Tennessee next year. And you'll also start to see that wheat whiskey and high rye bourbon um, coming out starting next year as well. Right on. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, Memphis whiskey awesome. is a, a very exciting thing. And uh, Kate, I mean, with Uncle Nearest, I mean, I feel like, you know, you guys are on the precipice, you know, of bringing out your own whiskeys, either your distilleries up and running now. Um, what's coming up for Uncle Nearest in the next year that we can look forward to? Sure. So we actually, so we have a partner um, bottler and a partner um, distiller right now. We actually have a DSP at that with that partner distillery. So we started laying down barrels in 2017. So what we just announced, and you can kind of see behind me, but we've got, we have some new labels coming out. Essentially, all of our product that we've been putting down has started to come to age. And with some challenges to supply chain with bottles this last year, um, we were, we made a pivot. We had created our own glass mold for our bottles that were meant to be released, let's call it maybe next year. Um, but we have our, we, we decided when the new bottles were going to be quicker to get than the old bottles. We have those, we said, if we have a new bottle, we should do a new label. If we have a new bottle and a new label, it's time to get our own juice in those. And so everything that you'll be drinking moving forward from Uncle Nearest um, coming out right now is our product. So it's 
it's we've hit the market since about end of January. So really, really exciting, um, really exciting stuff for us, actually. And it's so good. And I'm so excited because what we had before, which we had been sourcing, which we've never hidden was great. But this is fantastic. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm excited for both uh, products. I mean, uh, Memphis Tennessee Whiskey and Uncle Nearest Stone Juice. I mean, I can't wait. And out yeah. there as well, like anyone uh, out there, I think they should be excited for this as well. Because again, you know, this is a new interesting uh not style but uh whiskeys that are coming out that you know are you know it just adds layers to the uh whole conversation yeah. um so i have one more q a question for us and i think we'll wrap up here um demographics whoops I'm reading from the middle <laughs> sorry uh so i was curious if you all know the demographics of your customers for each of your brands higher women customers versus men? So I don't know, I don't have a lot of insight outside of my brand right now, um, like diving really deep, but I can tell you um, what I have from, you know, uh, direct to consumer type of data that I get from our partners that do online for uh, do online shipping. The buyers skew 50-50, but that doesn't mean the drinkers do. We have to remember that women make a lot of household decisions um, we also see that in our distillery sales, we are booking that it's it skews even higher than 50% women. Again, women tend to make the plans and tend to do that kind of stuff. So I think we do skew a little bit higher. I'd be, I, I think we would skew higher than the 30% average just because of the interest in, in the story and, and who we all are. But I don't, I don't know a hundred percent if that, if that's the drinkers, but that's, but we have, we're more closer to 50, 50. Yeah, same here. I don't know the specifics. I know we're we're a little more unique in the fact that we don't just have whiskeys. We do have mm. vodkas, we have gin, and we have a flavored bourbon as well. That do those are categories that traditionally appeal to women um, drinkers, and so we probably do have a decent amount of of women consuming our products. But I think it's right. probably leaning towards the clear spirits, and more clear, yeah, more so than the, the brown spirits. I would just like to say to any women that are watching, though, if you are drinking those vodka sodas, my favorite go-to is whiskey and soda, a highball, slice yeah. of orange. It's the same calories, no sugar, no gluten. You're literally the the vodka like branding and what vodka is able to tell everyone is that it's like it's healthy and there's nothing. It, it's this, all of our distilled spirits are really on a level playing field. So try out a whiskey and soda, see what happens. I promise you, you're going to get a little, you know, nothing wrong with vodka soda, but I promise you it's not healthier. <laughs> like that's, that's if, you want, if you want a little bit more flavor. <laughs> a little, kiss, little flavor. Yeah. Yes, I promise I mean, you. That's my go-to. I drink highballs. Yeah. I mean, because I love one, it. It's perfect. You need the water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's hydrating. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I had a couple of nice highballs last night and there we uh, go. yeah, it, it's the way to go. It really is. Um, yeah. Kate, Alex, I can't thank you enough for taking time to do this. Um, I really appreciate the conversation. Um, and just as we wrap up, is there any final thoughts you want to uh, leave us with? Alex? I, I don't, <laughs> I just really enjoyed it. It's so nice to meet Alex. So nice to meet Zach. I had a really yeah. fun tonight. This is a Fun little evening. So thank yeah, you guys this, for the opportunity. This is so much fun. And I just, I hope we get to a point where this stuff doesn't just happen one month of the year. We, yeah. we push this type of stuff year Everybody. round and, and just keep, Agreed. keep moving the industry forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen well said. That. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, Kate and for everyone watching out there, uh, keep an eye out for uh, what's coming up from Uncle Nearest and also for old Dominic. Yeah. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in uh, for this wonderful panel discussion. Uh, you can follow along for more panel discussions every week for Wednesday, same time. Next week, I'll be hosting one about I the Irish American whiskey experience and uh, how the uh, Irish migration helped form whiskey in America. You can also go to beverage.co and find our American Single Malt Tasting Kit uh, which will be uh, available through reservebar.com. And uh, yeah, there'll be more panels, there'll be more discussions. And uh, I just want to thank everyone for watching. Alex, Kate, have a wonderful uh, rest of your day, stroke evening. And uh, talk to everyone soon. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Okay.